my pleasure and privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Paul uh, DiBattito. I think I almost got it right. I knew I was going to stumble over that. But uh, Paul works at uh, a local company, Top Flight Engineering, who we've had the privilege to work with at Lincoln Laboratory quite closely. They're from the MIT community in, in large part and have been around it forever. So they understand how, how, uh, how we and that, this community all works. Top Flight is a relatively young company, uh, you know, a couple years old, but already you know, making, getting uh, points on the scoreboard, uh, recognized as a top startup in the Boston area uh, last year. Uh, and uh, we've uh, been working with them very closely. It's just amazing to me how fast they can go from a, an idea, so you've seen a lot of this lately here this month in all your courses, to a concept, to a design, to an actual working prototype in almost a blink of an eye. And, uh, and Paul will give you some idea about where the future, or what might be in store for all of us in the future here with, uh, with aerial vehicles and, uh, and transportation. Thanks. All right, thank you for your introduction. What a big group. Uh, work. So you guys are, uh, this is the, you're, you're almost done, right? The end of two weeks. It's almost here. And uh, has everyone been having a good time? Is uh, learn, learning a lot. I, I, I've been kind of following along. I, I am just blown away, at the, you know, like at your classes and the projects, and I'm just blown away what you guys are doing in high school. Uh, I don't think I was doing until I was in college or <laughs> in grad school. So that's great. All right, so uh, my talk is going to be about, there's my title, 50 plus years, still no Jetsons car. Anyone, anyone know what the Jetsons cartoon is? Maybe a couple of hands. Uh, back in the late 60s is when it actually aired. A uh, futuristic family, a normal family, but it was kind of about their everyday lives. But you know, they would here's George Jetson and his and his dog, and they would uh, fly in fly in cars like this. Uh, and they had robots as as uh, as maids in their houses and all sorts of futuristic. So that so the, so the concept and the idea for flying cars has been around for a long time. So kind of like robots, you know, where are all the robots? Uh, and they're coming, but um, we still don't really have the flying car. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, air, you know, the flying car and the concepts and, and kind of what, is, you know, what, is, what, is, what are some of the reasons that are holding it back. Uh, and uh, so this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you just one slide about my background, just because, I don't know, I've kind of been around a long time, so I thought maybe I have a few, few life lessons I can try to relay to you that may or may not be helpful to you in the future. Um, Let's talk about the flying car dream. What is the holdup? And, uh, and then I'll kind of stop for a second and talk about the drones, uh, drone revolution. How many of you guys, any of you guys play with or have drones, build drones, fly them? So actually quite a, quite a few. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. And what, what is it about the drone, you know, these drones? And, and are they inspiring some of the future aircraft designs that we're seeing? And we'll talk about that. And then there's, uh, you know, Houston, we do have a problem, and, and energy density is, is one of them, and we'll talk a little bit about that challenge. That's kind of what I'm going to focus on here today, sort of the energy side of, uh, side of things. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what I'm doing at my, at my startup, uh, the startup company that I'm involved with now, trying to build hybrid power systems. So basically, a Prius for the sky, flying Prius type ideas. Uh, and uh, hopefully leave you with the idea that you know, the aerospace field is an exciting place and uh, a, lot of, a lot of exciting times ahead, a lot of challenges to be solved. So something to think about when you're thinking about future, future careers. All right, so one slide about uh, my background. So uh, like a lot of young people, you kinda, there's some defining moment where you kind of decide what you're interested in. You're like, I see a fire truck, I want to be a fireman. I see a pilot, I want to be a pilot. So for me, uh, on my birthday, July 20th, 1969, I saw the, the astronauts land on the moon, and I saw it on a black and white TV with a picture that looked a lot like this. <laughs> and uh, you know, at that point, I was like, okay, I want to be an astronaut. That's it. I want to be an astronaut. So I uh, began like, building flying radio control planes. They weren't called drones back then, but they were model airplanes, probably at around age nine. Here's my, one of my planes. Uh, for years, got hooked on that. Did undergraduate in mechanical engineering. I did not go to MIT undergraduate. Went to, uh, I think what's now called, University of Stony Brook out on Long Island. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It used to be called kind of SUNY Stony Brook, State University of New York, the SUNY schools. So they didn't really have an aero major, so I did mechanical, but they did have some aero courses, so I tried to do a concentration on that. I, I built a solar-powered glider in 1986. That was my senior design project. 
more or less worked if you flew it around noon, between noon and two. And anyway, uh, then I came to, I uh, did come to MIT and did a master's in uh, Aero Astro, and those were some exciting times. Uh, I came here and I discovered control systems. I really had not had controls in undergraduate. I mean, you guys are doing it already in high school, and I really kind of discovered that at MIT, and I was like, oh, wow, this is cool. With computers, I can control machines, and even more so, I can control like airplanes. This is what I really want to, want to focus on. So uh, I, uh, I did that, and then after MIT, I began a career. I've been working on the space shuttle, actually. I worked on the uh, shuttle on-orbit flight control system software, and I began, I worked next door. There's a lab called Draper Laboratory. I don't know if you heard of it, but it's, uh, it's kind of like a mini Lincoln laboratory. It's also a laboratory that spun out of, of uh, MIT by uh, Charles Stark Draper. He really invented inertial guidance. So the gyros and the accelerometers that you have in your drones that keep the thing level and all that, that was really an invention by you know, Charles Stark Draper. And he uh, originally invented it for stabilizing the guns on, on World War II ships uh, to, so that they could better aim them. But uh, later, that became inertial guidance. And that's how we got to the moon. And that's how all the aircraft stabilize themselves, and that's how your drones stabilize themselves today. So, uh, but then, you know, I got interested in um, robotics. Man, robots, they, you know, they started to become more popular and uh, got involved in uh, robotic competitions. So I don't think I really have to tell you this because you guys are already involved in competitions, but it's a great experience to try to get involved in things like that when you're in school and college. Um, there was a thing called the Aerial Robotics Competition. I think it still goes on. The Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems, I think they still exist. They have ground and air competitions. So we uh, heard about that, put together a team back in 95, and we won it actually in 96 with this vehicle here. We were the first to do a fully autonomous flight from start to finish, uh, doing a little image processing in the loop as well. And that was a big deal. So this, this is an oversized model helicopter with a weed whacker type engine, and all, all this stuff on here, this is all the avionics. This is, you know, we had uh, you know, GPS and an IMU, which is inertial measuring unit, and, and all the sensors to fly it. That all weighed about 10 pounds back then. So, so here's all that capability now, right, in a Pixhawk that you could just go buy you know, on Amazon for, and that's what's powering your, uh, flying your drones. It's just amazing to me to see the, the, you know, the progress. Uh, worked on robotics for a number of years. I did a PhD at 47, and I'm telling you this because uh, I went back and did that. Uh, it's, it's, you know, learning is a lifelong endeavor. You really uh, uh, just, uh, it's not something like you, you know, especially in technology. If you want a long career in technology, it's learning is something you want to continually do. And, uh, and I encourage that. Uh, things are changing, technology is changing uh, very rapidly. And then finally, so now at 52, I'm, I'm at this, uh, I actually left R&D world to work at this local called Top Flight Technologies, and we are building uh, hybrid power systems for, for uh, more industrial-sized drones, and I'll, and I'll show you more about this and talk about that. All right, so that's uh, just a little bit of background about myself. So why don't we have the flying car right now? There are kind of three major reasons, and I'm only going to talk about one of them. But each of these could be a talk in themselves. One is regulations. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's probably at the top because it's one of the hardest things to solve. Um, you know, FAA regulations. Right now, you cannot even fly a drone greater than 55 pounds in the US unless you're flying on like a, a military reservation, uh, restricted airspace. Uh, you can fly your smaller drones, and there are even you know, rules on that. Uh, the other thing to think about is air traffic control. You know, there, are really, there really is no air traffic control yet for autonomous air vehicles. Um, if, and if you think about it, there are about 87,000 aircraft that fly in the US every day. Uh, that, that is under air, air traffic control. Uh, and if you think about cars, there are about 250 million cars that hit the road every day. So there's just no way we're going to be able to keep track of all these, uh, of all these cars if, if, they were, if everyone had like, their own plane and they were flying. So that's one of the challenges. And, and you know, there are a lot of people are working on this. And, there probably will be a new infrastructure at some point that may allow you know, autonomous uh, vehicles flying in some part of our airspace. The next is autonomy, safe autonomy. Um, uh, it's, there's a little bit, a lot of progress in autonomy. You guys here are working on autonomy, I think, in some of your classes, which is pretty cool. Uh, commercial aircraft are largely autonomous, no doubt, right? 
But think about it, in a commercial aircraft, it's a very, very highly structured environment that they fly in. The rules are very strict. Uh, they fly up high. There's really nothing to run into um, except for themselves. And they're constantly being monitored and tracked where they are. Um, and, uh, and so that's a lot different than, than the autonomous car world. And so you've probably been hearing a lot about autonomous cars. And autonomous cars are, are maturing, and they're, they're coming. But uh, that's a much more difficult environment. If you think about it, it's, a, it's challenging. It's very unstructured. It's very unpredictable. So unstructured, you have you know, some cars might be autonomous, some are not. You have pedestrians coming across the street. Um, you have some people that obey rules, some people that don't. So it's a very hard problem. There's you know, teams and lots of people, a lot of the major companies working on that. Um, and it's still, there, there are, there, you know, it's still really not safe. There was already one, one fatality with a, with a Tesla because of an autonomous problem. So autonomy problem. Uh, and then there's energy density. Okay, so one of the things you're probably going to see in the future is that even airplanes, you're seeing it now with cars that are becoming electric. Airplanes themselves, I think you're going to start to see more electric airplanes. And um, the problem is, though, the, the, the batteries are not coming along fast enough to really keep up with the, with the technology in, say, electric aircraft. So uh, you are seeing electric cars now that are fully electric, but they still have some limited miles. And they're, they're, uh, they're, those cars are actually relatively heavy. Still, so so, but there are there are a lot of advantages to using an electric plane, or electric source of power, and I have some of them listed here, being, being of of, of higher efficiency. They're they're more simpler. Uh, they're not not as noisy. They don't they don't have emissions, but um, but the energy density is an issue. So that's what I'm going to kind of focus on today, mostly in the in this talk. So let's step back for a second and look at the drone revolution. Uh, so really about 10, 15 years ago is really when these drones started to become popular. And uh, there, who can tell me what are like two key attributes that you think of when you, when you see the drones? What, what, how do you describe them? Can someone tell me like what are, what are two key like attributes about drones, say compared to a regular airplane? Yep, they're they're VTOL, right? They're they're not like a fixed wing. They're not flying. Yep. Most of them are autonomous balancing because they are they are not passive balancing. That yep yep. Most of them have active active balancing. That's right. You need active to control, and um, and then the other thing is that you notice that a lot of them are these multi rotor concepts now, right? Like so, the model airplanes I built had fixed wings, one propeller. You flew them. These are multi rotors. Is one thing. And, and then also, they're all, they're all battery operated now. These are all battery drones. I mean, what happened to the day when you, know, you had the little glow engine and you had to run it with the, the alcohol fuel and you made a mess? And, and uh, they're, all, they're battery operated, they're, they're autonomous, they're, they're, and they're multi-rotor. And it's even interesting that even though, even though a, uh, a fixed wing drone can fly you know, further and longer than, than a, than a you know, hovering type drone, um, if you look at like most of the drone, like 90%, 96% of the, the these these uh, flights that are used, like say for commercial or industrial purposes, these are these are the multi-rotor drones. People really like them. So so one question is, well, why why like why did we go from like normal airplanes to these multi-rotor drones and they're electric? And really, the, the the basic answer is that because they're simpler. They're 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 simple in two ways. One is. They, they are, uh, you know, there are electric. So, so if you look at a helicopter, is kind of our, our traditional an analogy, is a very mechanically complex machine. These things are great, but they are very complex. Um, it starts off the fact that you have an engine, and then you actually have to have a series of transmissions to deliver the power to the main rotor. You have another transmission system that goes and brings power out to the tail rotor, which gives you the counter torque, right? And then you have series of, you, you know, these, these blades in the main rotor are all actuated, right? If you want to go up and down, they work in unison. And if you want to, if you want to pitch and roll, they actually, uh, they actually change angle of attack in a sinusoidal type fashion to give you the roll and the pitch torques. So it's very complicated. The drone, all the drone has between the propulsion source and the energy source are wires and software and electronics. That's it, right? So now, um, now you achieve flight, and by by you know changing the speeds to the motors, 
it's all done, it's all done in software, right? If you want to go up and down, you just change all the, all the props in unison. If you want to pitch forward or roll, you change the props kind of differentially in software. So, so it really makes it, it's, it's a much simpler design, it's be, and it's very cheap and, and very, very reliable. And the, so that's what we have now in these, in these, I won't say toys, but these hobby drones that we fly. And you might say, well, are these kinds of concepts that you see in the drones, are they, are they influencing future designs of aircraft? Um, and I think the answer is, resounding, is a resounding, you know, yes, they are. Um, this, is a, this is a smattering of, of some of the probably the leading, leading uh, like flying plane type, flying car type concepts that there are now. And what, what, it, what kind of similarities do you notice between these designs and, and the drones that you guys are flying around, right? These, they're also multi-rotor multi -rotor vehicles. Um, they are, most of them uh, use multiple rotors. And um, what's not as apparent from the picture, but they are also largely talking about using electric propulsion. And again, why use the electric propulsion? Well, one reason is you, it's much more, uh, you don't have that mechanical transmission. It's very easy. You can place the, ro the motors, the propulsion motors, wherever you want them. It's just wires. Uh, and uh, so, so there's definitely been, um, so they're definitely influencing in the kind of designs. So what I wanted to do is I, I prepared a couple of uh, key videos that I thought we could watch together um, that talk about the state of the art. The first one talks about the state of the art of electric planes. And then the next two are about some of these flying car concepts that I think you guys will find, find interesting, I hope. So let's, 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 uh, let's see if I can get. Da, 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 da. All right, real quick. And, nope, not too happy. All right, hang on. Had this all queued up for you guys came. I was just kind of hoping that, uh... all right, tell you what, let me get rid of this. All right, let's go, let's try it again. Let's try it this way. I'll have to, uh... Guys, hang on. Isn't that funny? So there's another golden rule in engineering when it comes to like demos or talks. If there's anything that can go wrong, right? You're, it, it, it will when, when you least want it to. Okay, hang on. It's coming up here. All right. Okay. The electric revolution is taking to the skies. Battery tech is just getting good enough to allow several companies to roll out their fully electric aircraft into production. In this quick video, we'll take a look at the state of the art of fixed wing electric there? aircraft. Earlier this year, the German firm Simmons just demonstrated a powerful electric aircraft that broke two world records. The first was a speed record. It was the fastest electric aircraft flying at a straight line speed of 340 kilometers an hour. It also broke a climbing record, rising from the ground to three kilometers in just over four minutes. It was also the first electric aircraft to air tow. The aircraft, an extra 330 LE, was able to do this thanks to a new generation of electric motors from Simmons. Weighing just 50 kilograms, the motor can produce 260 kilowatts, about five times the power of comparable aircraft engines, or about as much output as the original Tesla Model S. Simmons plans to use this aircraft as a test bed for developing more in the future. Another company, Pipistrol from Slovenia, is getting ready to ship their fully electric light aircraft, the Alfa Electro. The Alfa Electro will be used for flight training purposes and takes 45 minutes to fully charge. The aircraft cuts overall costs of flight training by 70% from fuel savings, and the learning process is exactly the same as its petrol counterparts. 
Interestingly, every tenth of a second, the system on the aircraft checks the batteries, monitoring the voltage and looking out for any faults. It can electronically disconnect parts of the battery if the system predicts a fault. Upon landing, the propeller turns into a generator, recharging about 5% of the battery. Yet another company, Aeroelectric, is launching another all-electric plane called the Sunflyer. It has the same idea of reducing the cost of flight training. This is really a history-making event. Aeroelectric Aircraft Corporation has just unveiled a prototype of its new all-electric Sunflyer plane, which could open up the skies to many more pilots. By using electricity, they claim that the price goes down from $45 per flight hour down to $1 per flight hour for a more quantum leap. I think this use case makes the most sense for all electric air travel. Small planes, one to two passengers, and short trips from 30 minutes to 1.5 hours. It would be good for scenic aerial tours, short charter flights, or pilot training. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of electric propulsion? Well, the advantages are as follows. It's quieter, mechanically more efficient, and doesn't have any direct emissions. The disadvantages is the battery. The bottleneck really is with the battery energy density. It's just not good enough yet for long distance flight. In addition to this, with traditional aircraft, the more fuel you burn, the lighter the craft gets. But with electric aircraft, the batteries are essentially dead weight. But this is where hybrid systems come into play. More so than cars, hybrid planes seem to be the sweet spot for air travel. They can be used for medium distances, flying for about two to four hours. Airbus is working on a hybrid plane to go into production by 2030. This comes after successfully testing their own fully electric aircraft, dubbed the E-Fan, a project that ran from 2014 to last month. During its testing, the E-Fan was claimed to be the first electric plane to cross the English Channel. With help from Simmons, both Pipistrol and Airbus are in the works of creating hybrid motors, but the hybrid motor from Pipistrol is already in testing phases and makes about 200 kilowatts. So in conclusion, electric aircraft have been in the experimental stages for many decades, but were woefully underpowered and largely had the same issues as electric cars before Tesla got the ball rolling. Now, practical electric aircraft are right around the corner. In the next year or two, they'll be fully in service, but only for short range, low passenger volume situations. But it seems like hybrids aren't far off, and this could open the door to low emission, mid range flights with the benefits of both an electric motor and traditional power. And with that, that wraps up the video. This was just a quick look at the state of the art of electric fixed wing aircraft. All right, so that kind of gives you an idea of where, where electric aircraft are at this point. Um, you guys have any questions about that while I'm bringing up the next video? All right. Do planes also benefit from the advantage of the uh, torque curves of electric motors being maximum at um, zero RPM versus gas engine? Um, they, they do for like for takeoff. So you get like, right, you can get a more immediate thrust. And yes, they do. And I'm having a PowerPoint problem here, guys. Hang on. Sorry. <clears throat> Oops. Uh, all right, hang on. <clears throat> Audiovisual problems. Any other questions while I'm trying to get PowerPoint to work again? <laughs> okay, wait, I think we're. This is tough. <clears throat> All right, let's see. Let's try this one more time. All right, you know what? I think I will bail on this guy. Oh, OK. Gosh. <clears throat> OK, hang on.
We come from way, way, way. For us to connect with the culture like that, it means a lot. Obviously, we grew up in very, very different environments. I, I break my back down to the we make you to know each other, to know what you are. The day you leave your landlocked car behind and start flying to work okay. just got closer. This month, German aviation startup Lilium put its radical flying car design into the air for the first time. Like the famed V-22 Osprey, the Lilium jet takes off and lands vertically, like a helicopter, but flies horizontally like a plane. Unlike the Osprey, this funky thing is all electric, powered by batteries, not jet fuel. It works thanks to the idea of distributed propulsion, meaning you can stick as many motors as you want on there because each lifts more than it weighs. Helped along by lightweight design and a fuselage that works as a lifting body, this jet's 36 electric fan engines can lift two passengers straight into the air. Once in horizontal mode, it'll carry them nearly 200 miles in just an hour. At least that's what Lilium promises. Getting something to fly for the first time doesn't mean it's really going to work in the practical sense. Before you get to climb aboard, Lilium will have to spend years testing its design and getting regulatory approval and figuring out things like production and supply chains, along with the infrastructure that will allow these things to take off and land in cities or anywhere else. Rapid advances in battery tech and electronic flight controls make all this possible, and that's why Lilium's not the only game in town. China's Ehang is building a passenger-carrying drone it wants to launch in Dubai this summer. There's also Aeromobile in Slovakia and Terrafugia in Massachusetts. Joby Aviation, also in China, promises its own electric vertical takeoff and landing service in just five years. Uber, meanwhile, is more than ready to take any of these aircraft and put them into service in its own airborne fleet, which it hopes to launch within a decade. So, yeah, if Lilium and these other companies can really make this happen, the age of the flying car might finally be here, or just a few years off. Or just a few years off, but... Music is the ultimate connector of people, and it knows no boundaries. All right, I think I'm going to skip the third one because I'm getting, uh, I think, a little more time constrained than I thought. So what you can see is that the, um, you know, there's a lot of work going on in this area. Uh, you saw some concepts that look like they're actually flying, uh, and some of them are, some of them are. But uh, what, what, you know, what, again, they, they will currently fly, you know, these demonstrators are very short flights. Uh, you don't see them really carrying any people yet. Uh, so the weight capacity is kind of limited. So Houston, we actually, we really do have a problem. And what it, the problem is, is that the energy density from the latest, tech, you know, the current tech battery technology is still uh, almost two orders of magnitude less than what it is for common uh, fuel sources like gasoline or, or uh, natural gas or, or kerosene. So that's a problem. Uh, so the battery dens density is, uh, let's put up my little pointer here again, and uh, it is still kind of small compared to the other fuels. The other problem that batteries have is that, you know, they're, so they're, they're pretty heavy. And with a flying vehicle, unlike, uh, unlike jet fuel, as the plane flies, it's burning up its fuel and gets lighter. The batteries, you have to carry around those batteries uh, all the time. So even as the batteries deplete, it's the full weight, of, you know, you have that full, full uh, weight to deal with. Uh, and, and a typical airliner loses like 30% of its weight, of its takeoff weight by the time it lands. And the aircraft designers, that's part of, they, they count on that. That's part of the aircraft design. As a matter of fact, that's why airplanes, sometimes they'll dump fuel if there's an emergency and they need to land shortly after takeoff. Sometimes they will dump fuel because they're actually too heavy uh, and, and there's more risk of damaging the aircraft on a, on a landing with a very full, full uh, fuel load. So, you know, if you try to take the current technology that's going into electric cars, like the Tesla car, uh, which their base model had a, like a 150 watt, watt hour per kilogram type battery, uh, this, the, the weight of the battery uh, in, a, in a Tesla was, is about 400 kilograms. If you tried to apply that to some air, air vehicles, so I used here two examples, a small helicopter, a small two-seater, and then a large helicopter, like a military Black Hawk, uh, you see that, you know, this has about a three hour endurance. To try to get the same endurance, which is about three hours for this guy, uh, that battery would weigh about 2,000 kilograms. 
the whole aircraft only weighs 400 kilograms, and the same kind of you know gasoline used to, to uh, fly that is about 58 kilograms. So it's it's uh, it's that's not going to work. And then uh, same thing with the Black Hawk. Again, this Black Hawk has about a two-hour endurance, and uh, the empty weight of the Black Hawk is about this, and with the battery pack would be about almost 18,000 kilograms. Uh, and so, so you see, you know, compared to about 1,100 kilograms of jet fuel that they currently use. So, so that's that's so batteries are you know not quite there to to you know that we can just sort of replace, get rid of the jet engines and put in put in electric, and put, replace with batteries. The other thing is that the batteries have some other challenges that you're probably aware of now because you you uh, heard here in the news. And, but first of all, batteries besides having um, they, you know they they also do dissipate heat especially when you discharge them at a high rate. So, so you also have to have uh, cool, some sort of cooling systems involved. And even whether they're active, like if you use liquids, or whether it's a passive cooling, they, that, that usually means you have to have some materials, and that, that means weight. So that's something else you also have to, to, to uh, factor in. And then finally, there's a safety issue. Um, you know, the lithium ion batteries, which is probably our state of the art right now, at least you know, commercially, uh, you hear about them kind of catching on fire. And uh, and uh, uh, even 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 in the aircraft, but some of the batteries that were trying to be introduced in the air, aircraft, and I, I really can't you know understate the importance of battery safety. Uh, uh, I'm going to try to bring this guy up. Let's see what happens. But uh, I've actually personally with Listen, our I know you our, have your police and I totally had respect an issue. that. I don't have a video of I that, bought but something I did want for you to before this. I knew about the whole atheist thing. Yeah. I've been holding on to All it, right. which is <laughs> really silly. Well, maybe not that, but let's. The lithium so, ion battery. Just to impress or upon you, battery they had. It was also this is a NASA ion, robot that's using lithium. You may have seen this. Site for an activity but they were going to be performing. This really happened. They were charging. There's your scanning lidar. coming off that battery. Everything was going fine. Yeah. Could you imagine if those guys were still standing right there? I mean, that would have been that would have been very, very dangerous. And the other and point is, the these fires if you notice, are very when that fire came hard out, to put out. Exactly where our researchers were standing, it could have been a very bad day. This is an intern from the adjacent laboratory. Yeah, he had climbed through a window. Yeah, he was so not associated with this project. If he you're an intern an and that happens, don't breathe. Don't you know? Get just get out of there and pull the fire alarm. Don't try to put it out yourself. The safety data sheet had called for a type B fire. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Wait, wait for it. Wait for it. One of the things we're learning yeah, is wait a for type it. D and a CO2 fire oh. extinguisher are not effective in putting out these type fires. One misnomer is in lithium ion batteries, there is not a lot of free lithium. So water is the best method at dissipating the heat and putting out these type fires. The smoke you see coming off of that battery contains hydrogen fluoride, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. Again, don't try to put it out. At the oh. same time you saw the intern coming into the laboratory, another intern had gone out and pulled the fire extinguisher, alerting the fire department. They were en route. When they responded, they came in an appropriate PPE. They also grabbed a CO2 fire extinguisher that was available in the location. And this was also it's, it's ineffective not a, it's at putting not a, out uh, fire. All right. OK, you get the idea, right? So uh, again, I just don't want to, I want to emphasize battery safety. Never leave your lithium ion batteries charging overnight, unattended, et cetera. Um, so, so basically, all right, I guess I'm getting low on time, but I was going to switch gears a little bit and just tell you now about, you know, since batteries by themselves can't really do the job yet, however, we don't have to necessarily just wait for battery technology. There are other solutions. And one of them is to use a hybrid, a hybrid energy, a hybrid energy power type system, basically like the way cars started out being electrified, right? The Prius is really the first electric car that came, kind of came out as a hybrid electric with, with some sort of an engine. And by taking advantage of, of new, you know, new technology, technologies in that area, we can keep pushing the, the envelope in what we can, uh, what we can achieve. Um, again, a, a hybrid electric system, you get the benefits of the high energy density in the fuel, but we can also get the, get the advantages of, uh, of using electric power. Um, so for all the reasons that I kind of mentioned before, 
it completely decouples the mechanical system from uh, from the train, you know, not needing a gearbox for like we use in traditional aviation design, reduces complexity, uh, makes the systems more modular. You can add more propulsion systems, so designing aircraft can happen, I think, a lot faster. You'll see more designs uh, being turned out, at a, you know, at a higher rate, almost like a Lego-like kind of kind of uh, uh, way of, of designing aircraft. So there are, a lot of, there are a lot of reasons why at least hybrid, in the, for now, makes, makes a lot of sense. And um, not that there aren't other technologies, there are new battery technologies you know, coming down the pipe, there are hydrogen fuel cells, things like that, other, other sources of energy that will be, but these are largely still kind of in a, in a research phase. Um, it's not easy, it's not really necessarily easy building a hybrid, hybrid engines, uh, because again, we're trying to build a very high energy dense, so we want a very high power to weight ratio kind of system. Um, and uh, the usually when you're trying to build a very energy dense uh, power system, you want to run these things at high RPMs, and high RPMs means your enemies are heat and vibration. So uh, these are things that, that we're constantly tackling, uh, looking at different kinds of motor, you know, because motors, uh, you know. Traditional motors, you try to run them at very high, high speeds, uh, they generate a lot of heat as well. So we're looking at alternative motor designs uh, and, um, and also then how you actually couple the engine with the generator, with the motor to create this generator system is, uh, is kind of a complex thing. And we're trying to do it without, without using any gearboxes. That's the idea. We, we want no, you know, no mechanical uh, coupling there, no, no mechanical gearbox. So uh, basically, you know, we're trying to do this. This is an example of our, this is actually our second generation little system. It's a 10 kilowatt hybrid, hybrid energy system that, uh, and uh, we are introducing that into a, into like an industrial sized drone. This is actually, I couldn't bring the whole drone. It's a little large, uh, but I brought one of the arms here. So you're welcome to, if there's time afterwards, come down pick it up, take a look at it, we can talk about it. But that's one of the arms, one of four arms, so it's basically a quad, ro it's a quad rotor configuration, but we actually have eight rotors, uh, one on top and bottom. Um, you lose a little bit of efficiency doing it that way, but, it's, uh, but it's, there's a reliability uh, that you gain by having, having that extra arm. So basically, kind of to compare, um, what we have is a 10 kilowatts of power from this guy, and um, it weighs eight kilograms. And I guess what I could find that's comparable is your, your, your Honda generator that you can go buy at Home Depot also gives you about 10 kilowatts of power, and that weighs 183 uh, kilograms, so almost 400 pounds. So kind of shows you uh, sort of a comparison. And we are, um, we are this is sort of our roadmap. Uh, we're kind of starting small. This is our second generation is at 10 kilowatts. We originally built one that was 1.8 kilowatts as sort of a proof of concept. We currently are working on a 100 kilowatt engine that still is going to use a, a internal combustion engine married with a, 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 an electric motor for generator. Um, and that, that is about the power you need to fly, like that small helicopter, that Robinson type helicopter. And then as you work your way up to say 250 kilowatt uh, engine, which we will start to move away from a gasoline type engine, move either to a diesel or a gas turbine. Now you're talking about uh, now you're talking about a, you know starting to replace a helicopter, like a Bell Range, uh, like a Jet Ranger or something. Um, and now when you talk about a one about one megawatt or so uh, type system, you're definitely talking about using a, a turb, you know a turbine, uh, marrying a turbine with a generator type system. Um, if you think about it, aircraft have already do have a hybrid system, and then the, and the airliners have an auxiliary power unit, the APU. And if you ever notice, but there's a little hole in the back of the in the back of airliners, and there's actually a little a little jet engine. Uh, it's part of a, uh, that that is uh, through a gearbox uh, turning a generator, and that's what provides power to airliners uh, when they're like when they're sitting on the ground and whatnot. Um, so that's what we're doing there. I had a few. This is our, this is our, in our uh, what we're calling the 10K hybrid, uh, the Airborg. It, uh, it can fly about three, it can fly up to three hours with a four kilogram uh, payload on it, or about an hour with 10 kilograms of payload. 
and it's uh, the whole thing weighs about uh, you know about 55 uh, kilograms or so. And I have a few quick videos. What we're trying to do is sort of bridge this um, bridge this gap here uh, between the small you know drones that you're familiar with that are that are delivering pizza boxes, and uh, you know in a large you know, in the large drones that, that say the military are using, uh, we see that there's a, at our, at our startup, we see a, what we think is a, is a market for these, uh, uh, to start off with, with these, with these uh, smaller, these in, in, between, you know, in between drones that can carry, you know, tens of pounds of, of payload or maybe 100 pounds of payload um, to various destinations. And, uh, okay, so I have a few quick little videos I thought might be more interesting than me talking. Uh, this first one is, this is what we do uh, when we fly it indoors. We actually have a little, uh, we actually have a, an indoor test setup uh, that we use to, uh, to sort of ring it out. And here, this was one of our early endurance flights where we flew it for an hour and 40 minutes. We filled up the gas tanks about halfway. We can carry five, five gallons of gasoline in them. And, uh, we can fly for, uh, for uh, this one flew for an hour and 40 minutes. Since then, we have, we have flown close to the three hours, but I don't have a video for that guy. And we were carrying a little over four, four kilograms of payload uh, to just sort of demonstrate that. So this is flying. It's, a, it's autonomous, but it's, it's holding altitude itself. It's constrained, obviously, in position. And you don't have GPS inside, at least we don't here. And so uh, um, it is, it's, it's not trying to hold position. It is trying to keep itself level and it is trying to hold altitude. And in this test, we actually didn't have a LIDAR ranger for the altitude. We were using the bar barometric par you know, pressure, so you can kind of see that the barrel sensors tend to be noisy. And so you can see it was kind of going up and down quite a bit. So that's one little short video. And then, um, so here, so I wanna, this, this sort of illustrates the, the, you know, I talked about having the reliability. A hybrid system gives you reliability because you have, you have an engine and you also have the battery. So. Here we're flying, and one of our propulsion motors begins to fail, one of these guys. And then shortly after, it completely fails and it stalls. It stops moving, and it's because there was a short. And that momentary short actually cut the ignition and killed our hybrid, our engine. So what we were able to do there is the engines died, but we still have we you know we still have battery. We have battery for several minutes of flight on um, pure battery. So we were able to uh, to basically state you know the system stabilizes and we were able to land it. Um, so that's where having extra reliability of the of the hybrid uh, is useful. And let's see, I have one more short. Thing to try and see if I can get this to work. Came up the first time. So this is our, um, this is my, so this is the CEO of our, our startup, and he was actually one of my former students, actually my first student years ago, and now I'm working for him. So that's how that goes. But uh, here's Long, Long Fan talking about his. Uh... Airborg is our UAV platform that addresses three challenges for all battery based multi rotor drones the ability to fly for multiple hours, carry a substantial payload and have sufficient onboard power for sensors and data communication. We're introducing the Airborg HH-10K, a small cargo multifunction hybrid powered drone for extended flight and enhanced payload capabilities. The Airborg is a serial hybrid power UAV. Our team comprised largely of MIT PhDs and engineers developed this miniaturized hybrid power systems while alleviating heat and vibration issues. It uses readily available gasoline to generate the power that drives the lift motor and powers all onboard electronics. With hybrid engine power, you don't need to charge your batteries between flight. If you run out of fuel, refuel the tanks and immediately fly again. With our comprehensive flight control system and excess power, the Airborg can be fast adapted to your industry application specific needs. We are able to customize our platform with sensors, additional safety features, different cargo, and custom landing gear. With the modular hardware design, parts are minimal and maintenance is straightforward. Flight control can be semi or fully autonomous with missions developed first in a simulator. 
We firmly believe that the Air Board creates the opportunity to address more extensive aerial data acquisition and transport solutions that were once limited to conventional fixed-wing airplanes and helicopters, but at a fraction of those operating costs. With the Airborg, our customers can complete more frequent aerial missions for any applications requiring integrated endurance, onboard power, and payload. All right, I think that's pretty much it. Getting there. So uh, I just have two last quick slides, and um, I'd love to just ask if, see if you guys have any questions. Basically, there's going to be a lot of activity in this area in the, in, uh, you know, in the coming future. So uh, um, I think uh, this whole notion of like an air taxi, uh, I don't know if it'll be flying cars as, we, as, as it was portrayed with the Jetsons, but uh, you, know, you could very well see uh, the idea of like an air taxi type thing. Uh, happening in the future, a lot of the companies, the Amazon, Google, and many others, Uber, they're all they're all sort of positioning themselves and doing research in this area because I think people see it as a as a, you know something that that, that can be achieved. Um, and uh, I guess uh, is the stream still alive? I think the answer is yes. You've seen there are a lot of a lot of efforts going on, a lot of things going on. Uh, you've seen some concepts that are actually in development or actually some of them being prototyped. Um, hopefully I've shown you that you know, energy is one of, the, one of the challenges still to be solved among un the other challenges that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, the FAA, I think eventually are, are, we will figure things out. There will probably be a new infrastructure that's needed in order for all this to work. I don't think it's going to be a free-for-all. You probably won't be getting in your, in your own little personal flying car and from your driveway and flying, but you may, you know, you may end up having to go to specific places where you, know, you would then call up a service or something and it would take you someplace. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. So with that, I wanna end, I think I went a little bit over, but uh, if you're not in a rush and if, and if there's time, we'd love to talk, answer questions. So thanks, thanks for your time. Thank you. Do we have time? Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. I wanted to ask why you chose personally. What motivated you to move from your research environment to joining a business and like actually developing a product instead of maybe just researching other technologies? Oh, okay. So, well, it's a good question. So, um, yeah. So I spent a long time in R and D. Um, so I am sort of still doing. I'm kind of. Uh, I'm not really on the business side. I am the actually the, the VP for software engineering. So actually, my background is really in autonomy and controls. Uh, and so that's sort of what I'm bringing to this company. Is, as you see, they're, they're developing a lot of this, this, the energy system and the power system. I'm kind of more focused on building the team to, uh, to, to, uh, you know, to develop the autonomy and whatnot. And to answer your question is, um, I don't know, you know, I think one of the things is you should never be afraid to try you know, new things. Uh, being out of your comfort zone is really sometimes the way you really learn the most. And for me, that was a big deal going from a steady career, 30 years you know, at a laboratory to doing this. So I just felt it was kind of time to try something, you know, try something different. And, uh, and also, I do enjoy working with uh, you know, talented young people and teams. So that's kind of what I do is you know, get a good team together that works well together. To me, that's very, very satisfying to have a dedicated team that's working on, a, on a hard, hard problems. Um, other questions? Um, so you said the FAA requires all drones to be under 55 pounds. Is your drone under 55 pounds? Or yeah, no, it's not. Yeah. That's a problem. <laughs> no, so, <laughs> so it is. That's true. It is. Uh, so we cannot fly with. So you either have to have a special waiver to do that. Uh, but our drone could be used, say, for military purposes. Uh, could be or. It can be used in other countries. So a lot of the other countries, um, Europe, Canada, uh, they have rules similar to FAA, but they're a little bit more willing to, to open that up. If you notice, some of these companies like the Amazons and Googles, to go test their UAVs, they've gone to like Australia, Canada, uh, I think one of them in England. So, so, so it's, uh, yes, yeah, so the answer is we're actually, commercially, we're actually looking 
outside of the U.S. right now until until things get uh, sorted out. Good question, Matt. Is there some sort of a union or lobbying group that's trying to get the FAA to come around? Because I know they have like a lot of uh, reasons why they want to keep under 55 and why they have a lot of restricted airspace. So um, is there like a group that's, um, is there like some sort of united effort to convince the FAA to, I guess, allow you guys to fly? Or is it just, are you guys are just Yeah, closed? we certainly don't have enough money to do that. Uh, but but yeah, I mean you know I mean companies like I'm sure like the Amazon like that that pic, that um, slide I showed you like this this uh, picture here on the right that's from an Amazon you know white paper that they wrote I think they kind of wrote it to sort of talk to the FAA about this notion of um, this notion of uh, uh, we kind of call it the agile aerospace area so this area here the zero to four hundred feet. Really, we kind of think that this is going to be where you're going to see a lot of activity of these drones. So you, uh, not, you know, not trying to integrate them into, into the real airspace where the airliners and airplanes are flying, but something down lower. Of course, they're going to have to have collision avoidance capability. They're going to have to stay away from airports. They're going to have to be able to avoid or not go near uh, very, very tall buildings. But this is an area that I think a lot of these companies are seeing as almost like very, very valuable real estate. Uh, so whether you're delivering packages or maybe eventually air taxis, that's probably where you're going to see like new infrastructure or new new uh, regulations. Um, yeah, but I so I'm sure there are act, there's activity there. I mean we're not <laughs> we're not the lobbyists, but uh, yeah, it'll take some time. So I think that's, All right, we've got to cut it short for questions right now. But again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Team down here to, to, to give our speaker a gift.